Hi, I'm Shauna Lampy Legary, and welcome to this week's video. You can see that winter has arrived in Yellowknife. We've had plenty of snow and it's getting darker and darker. The sunrise is at 8.30 in the morning and going down at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And we're about six weeks away from solstice. So every 10 days we lose one hour of light because we're losing six minutes every single day now. It's very noticeable very quickly. Today is Remembrance Day. And on this day in 2015, my father-in-law passed away, Don. And this painting that I'm doing is to honor him and to remember his love of flowers. He loved to garden and in his later years, flowers is what he could manage the best as we get older. You can't do the big vegetable garden you did when you were younger. I will be painting this bearded iris that Don grew in his yard. I've painted a number of his flowers over the years. Take a moment to subscribe, like the video, and click the bell notification so you don't miss the next video. I'm gonna grab my paint tools and let's get going. Here I have a gridded board. You can't see the grid, it's very, very pale. I removed most of the graphite. And I'm using an image that's gridded on my iPad and that's what I'm working from to draw this bearded iris on. My father-in-law took up painting when he was 65 in fact, he painted right until he was going to the hospital. He drove himself to the hospital. He was a hobby farmer, and there's our oldest with him on the horse that they had at one point. And here's our middle son with his grandpa Legary and his cousin Jacob. So I'm just working along on this drawing, and there is the youngest, who is the spitting image of his grandpa Legary. He is literally a foot taller. And there's grandpa Legary with our darling Burke. We really missed Dawn. So I have painted some of his flowers over the years, because I'm not always down at the right time to take pictures of flowers. And his morning glories one year were so beautiful that he actually tried to drag them into the house to see if he could keep them going. It didn't work. <laughs> he would have fields of flowers and poppies were one of the things he had and these sort of frilly purpley ones were amongst all the beautiful red ones that he had. We went this summer and his daisies had migrated right up into the, what was the front yard which was all grass when we were younger. Don liked to paint. He'd paint anything. He'd paint on pillowcases. He would paint on any kind of board. Here are a couple of Don's paintings of Northern Lights from 2013. Here he is after a long hot day of going out and taking pictures of flowers with me in Edmonton. So as I'm working along, you can see that I've started to darken where the green is. Now we're gonna mix colors. And what I wanna mix are the bokeh, colors that are in the background. You saw on the image that there are these little round circles. Those can be caused by having your f-stop very narrow, like 5.6, and having the background far away, and it really, captures the light and the light creates these bokeh. Now you can also create it on a program like Affinity or Photoshop, which also works very well and which is how I did mine. So I've done cadmium yellow light and I did value five, four, three. And now I'm using cadmium red medium to create a low chroma paint mixture and I'm just adding it to the neutral gray, a little bit of that paint color to that neutral gray. Here we go with the Chronochrodome magenta, sort of these purpley colors. I was seeing all sorts of interesting colors in the background, so I created a range of values. I wanted to come from the back to the front because I could see there were darker ones and lighter ones that were near the front. 
create that illusion of depth, I'm going to use all these values. Now I'm adding phthalo green yellow to the neutralized gray. You can go see the video that I've done on how to create a neutral gray value string. The link is below. You can get Golden's value 8 to value 2 neutral gray. That is fantastic. It would be Munzel approved if Munzel was still around. Now on to the background we go. And here we're using a value 2 of the neutralized gray. That's the darkest I'm going to get on this painting. I did the whole background and I'm going to try and move through this fairly quickly. Here we go, the first layer is almost done. And I wanted the background to be fairly dark, but I don't work any darker than value 2, so I wouldn't use a pure black on this. If you put black against it, you would notice that it's not as dark as you think it is. Even when I'm doing a raven, the darkest value might be a value 3, with a little bit of value 2 here and there. But in this painting, value 2 seemed to be the answer. And now the third layer is done. And now what I realized is the bokehs would be too light. I felt like the paint that I had was too light. So I took some of the value two, took some of the value three that it was already mixed with the red and or with the magenta as this one is, and I just added it to value two. So it's only got a hint of color in it. It's really almost completely gray, but just enough color to be different from the background. I start with the darkest values that I can see in the bokehs. They're all just circular shapes. And I will come in, just giving it a bit of time to dry and soften the edges of each of them. Especially important, not in the really dark ones, but as the bokehs lighten up, that will be really important. So I'm doing dark greens, I'm doing dark reds, I felt like it needed to be lightened a bit, so I added a little bit of the lighter value. The brush that I'm using is a Rosemary and Company Ivory Dagger. I really like the daggers. I like the shapes of them, and they've really worked well. It's a very small brush. I will have the list below for the brushes that I used in this process. And now I soften the edge with the soft brush. And when I'm doing the circles, I'm going to go over the flowers, but I'm going to come with my stiffer brush and I'm just going to remove that paint because I want to keep those spaces clear. You don't actually have to clear it like I do, but I kind of like how neat and tidy it is. I'm not going to do every single bokeh on this video. My intention is to demonstrate how to do them. So here's some red ones. A very small amount of color that's in the gray is really a Munzel 2 or maybe into a Munzel 4, which is more gray than colorful. We want it to be mostly gray. I really enjoy doing the bokehs because that's a different look for a background of a painting. I've never done that before. And I have to say, I haven't really painted many flowers in acrylic. I mostly do watercolor. So you can see we got lots more done all of a sudden. Here we are, getting close to the end of adding the bokehs. Now you can notice the layering that I'm doing. The darker bokehs look like they're further back. And as I add a little bit more light into the values, they look like they're moving forward on the background plane. Soften the edges. And then go to the next one.
Yeah, working with acrylic is a very different medium compared to watercolor, that's for sure. And clean that off. Bring in another yellow one down here. And now we're setting up to do the greens of the leaves and of the stems. The colors that I have put on here, I make a series of tubes of value eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, using cadmium yellow light and ivory black, bone black, whatever black you have. I have a video named, It's All About Green. The link is below. And then you'll notice that I've put some of the phthalo blue green shade at the bottom of the palette. It gives me a really good base of green, but now I can tweak it to make it more blue if I need to. The other thing you notice is I have my neutralized grays on the other side. And I'm always mixing my grays in to neutralize the colors to make them seem more realistic. It helps to contain the green, so it's not quite that sort of bright, crazy green that we see. Our photographs tend to show that kind of bright, crazy blue-green, at least on my camera it does. And I always go into my photo editing program and I lower the saturation and all of a sudden that green looks more realistic. Cameras don't see the way our eyes do. You'll also notice that I'm basically doing a light, medium, and a dark for that, this very first pass. And I'm adding gray every single time. I don't do just a pure color. I have neutralized it just a bit to make it work better. Back and forth we go. So now we are going to create the yellow string that we're going to use of Cad Yellow Light and Raw Umber. And I'm doing value nine is Cad Yellow Light, eight, seven, six. This is value five. This mixing right now is Raw Umber and White and I'm just doing different values, and then I realized I didn't quite make it dark enough, so I pulled it back and made it a little bit darker so that I have a light, a medium, and a dark to work from. I'm creating sort of a base color that has a little bit of the cad yellow light, a lot of value nine gray, and a lot of white to get, sort of get that creamy white that I was seeing and work from there. You'll notice along the bottom, I have a range of grays. Those are actually not neutralized grays. The neutralized grays are on the right side. On the bottom are actually just black and white because I needed some that had a little bit more blue to it. And I have put cerulean blue there so that I at times can add a little bit more blue to my gray to make it fit better. So we're just going through the first pass. Doing a white flower is a little bit challenging because they're not really totally white and you need to make it look realistic like it could be that. We think it's white, but if you just did pure white, it just won't look right. That base color that I've created, I'm working with. I've added a little bit more white, a little bit more gray, some of that lighter raw umber, some more, a little bit more yellow, just to get that creaminess. And now here's some grays for the shadows. And you can see that I pulled in that, the blue gray that's at the bottom that's not neutralized because I was seeing a hint of blue from the sky in the flower. 
But of course, it's not blue-blue, it's just a gray that looks blue. Now I'm creating that neutralized sort of value eight color. The first pass is just to get the information on there so that you can come back and correct. Maybe you don't get the shapes exactly right. If you're close enough, then you can correct easily enough, you know, on the second pass. And I'm just building up, building up, and I'm still using the same dagger brush pretty much through all of it. There were some areas I couldn't control it as well, and I would move to a different brush. And when I was softening the edges, I was using a stiffer brush, which is my Princeton Dakota. Now I'm creating some darker values to put against it. This painting took about 17 hours to paint the whole thing. I never actually track my time, but you know, when you're recording it, you can go back to all the film and, and count the minutes. It's kind of crazy. I think I'm gonna let the music play for a while and then I'll come back and speak again. This is the darkest shadow that we have on this flower. Flowers are really interesting to paint because the flower petals are so thin, which creates this really interesting luminosity that is such an interesting challenge to paint because you want the petals to look like they're as thin even though they're two-dimensional on a board. So when I am painting a flower, I'm always thinking about how fragile these beautiful blossoms are. The flowers don't last long, but they keep coming back year after year. To me, they have this hardiness and this fragility that's such an interesting combination. Now I'm coming into the second pass. The first pass, I was kind of just getting the green in there and now I have something to compare against and I'm moving my brush around and I'm using that phthalo green just a little bit more to get some of that bluer color in. I don't want it to be as blue as the picture is because of course my camera especially seems to make those greens really hyper blue and I know they're not. So it's always a fight that I have is to sort of keep the leaves looking as realistic as I think the green should look. Remembering that light also reflects off of other objects and is bouncing around in the space. This flower I've taken out of context a bit because I've changed the background. There was a building close by. There was just different things happening in, in and around the space of where I was photographing this flower. And I soften all the edges with acrylic. You don't have much time, so I put a little bit of paint on and then I come and soften the edge with a really stiff brush and I move it around. And I'm always doing that. I'm trying to create that illusion of dimensionality. That's a lot of little bits of paint. Sometimes you'll see me just put a stroke down and then move it around. Put another stroke down and move it around. It's not big movements, it's little wee movements that add up to something that looks really realistic. If you wanna head over to my blog, you can see a really good picture of this painting, or you can go and check me out on Instagram or on Facebook. I'm not super active on either of those, so I'm not gonna wear you out, <laughs> but I do have those accounts.
building the shape, I realized that I had sort of not finished that shape there. And now let's move on to this one here, this leaf that's come in behind the iris. And each leaf is capturing the light just a little differently because it's turned a slightly different way. I find that quite fascinating. So I've added a light portion and a dark portion, and while the paint is still wet, I've come in and I blend them together to create that illusion of shape. And it works really, really well. So I don't do the whole stem, I'll just do a small section of the stem. Here we are moving back to the lower part, still neutralizing with my neutralized gray, looking at how the leaf is bent because it's not straight, and where is it lighter, where is it darker. Putting a little bit of paint, moving it around with my Princeton Dakota brush. I love using that brush. I can move the paint around easier. It's got a nice stiffness to it. So I want to create the illusion that the leaf is bending away from the light and towards the light and it takes little bits of paint. This is really about patience. This is a long video. I spent 17 hours painting it. I even removed some of the video time because we didn't need to watch every single bokeh be painted. Now I'm coming in behind that leaf behind that has a really delicious shadow happening on it. So I'm going to come and take that dark and the cast shadow from the flower is on that leaf. Yet it has some of the nicest, brightest area because it's bent towards the light and is reflecting off the flower a bit that, that light as well because it's bouncing around the space. I'm cleaning up some of the areas where I didn't get the background shape quite right. So I have my background value two that I'm working with. We're still doing the first pass. We're still trying to get everything covered. I haven't got everything covered yet. I've done the first pass, I'm on to the second pass in the green and I'm on the first pass for the flowers still. What you don't see, again, as I always say in my videos, is you don't see me step back and look and make sure that what I'm seeing with the image and what I'm seeing with the painting is actually working. It really is important not to sort of get mired down and not to step back and have a really good look at what you're doing. So just close your eyes for a minute and then when you open your eyes, you get sort of that fresh look again. Here I am with the value two, building up that area that I had missed when I was doing the background. Now we're back to the flower. This is the cad yellow light value string. I have a video that shows how to darken uh, cadmium yellow light appropriately with the raw umber. The link is below. Adding in some of that shadow work here. And the shadows will be lighter and they'll be darker and the subtlety of it. Remember when we did the sphere? The link is below. 
and we had the light light, the medium light, and the dark light. Well, I've created those in here because I have, you know, that subtle shifts of light on a very bright object is something that I'm working on. And here I'm doing the under area where there is light coming through and reflecting off the yellow. That is the lovely bearded iris little stems. Building that up where I'm seeing some green in behind there. So there's all these little subtle shifts that I'm putting in and I'm not using a huge range of colors to put them in. I'm just putting in different values and softening the edges with my Dakota brush and using the dagger brush to Sorry, I get watching my painting and then I'm like, ooh, I'm lost. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> There's subtle shifts in how the petal just turns a little bit away from the light and yet other parts are towards the light. Flowers are a really great and less stressful way to learn all of those shifting values that you're seeing here. Every petal is different in a flower. And even if you had a whole bunch of the same flower, every petal is, is slightly different in how it's capturing the light and how the cast shadows are happening. And sometimes I make them a little darker than they actually are because I need them to be defined right away, but I will come back and I will lighten that up as time goes on. Little subtle shifts. So let me tell you about my father-in-law. Don was a farmer at heart. He had chickens and ducks and geese. And one time when our oldest was about three years old, we heard him sort of screaming outside, making lots of noise. And then there was a goose making lots of noise. So we looked out the window and then we ran because the goose was chasing our three-year-old. And then next thing that happened was the goose's neck came through Alexander's legs and Alexander's got his neck. The goose is squawking, Alexander's squawking. We're running as fast as we can and it was long before you had your cell phone with you. Mind you, you weren't stopping to take video of it. <laughs> you were getting that goose away from, from him and into its pen again. <laughs> and Dawn... I always, always had a garden, always a big garden. So if you asked him for something, we didn't live there, so we didn't have that happen very often. If you asked him for a couple of tomatoes, he would bring you three dozen of them because he had so many. And he had a beautiful garden. The kids loved to go in. He would say, here's the hose. And we were living in the far north, so gardens were not something that was happening, especially when we lived in Frobisher Bay. So the kids really enjoyed going and getting carrots and cleaning them off and eating them fresh out of the garden when we were down visiting. You saw in the pictures they had a horse at one point and that didn't last really long. Ian's mom really wanted a horse and so she had the horse for as long as she could and, and then times changed and, and so the horse went away. Here I am starting to do the veining on the flower. Just adding those little touches. Well, I've added in some of the low chroma yellow and the raw umber to create that bronzy color that I'm seeing in the veining. And I have a detail brush. I will link it below and tell you exactly which one it was but it's a long liner kind of script liner one to make this happen. And you have to add a lot of water so that the paint will flow off your brush quite easily. 
So one year we were living in Frobisher Bay. If you look for that, it's on Baffin Island in the far north of Canada. And mail took a long time in those days, in the 80s when we were there. And I asked him for some books. And so he sent me the books. But when we got the box, it smelled like the chicken coop. And I was like, what on earth? Thankfully, even though it was April, it was still 30 below outside. So we stuck it outside to freeze it. And it turned out that he had decorated hard-boiled eggs and had stuck it in the box with the with the books, no protection, no nothing, just put them all together. <laughs> and so he received a phone call that said, please do never do that again. That's not a good idea. It just takes way too long to get our mail. He just didn't want the boys to be excluded when he was doing with his other grandchildren, you know, the Easter eggs and so forth. Anyway, it was cute. So as I said, when he was 65, he took up painting. And so now we had something in common. We were both painting. And in 2013, he came for a visit and he and I drove up from Edmonton. My husband had meetings elsewhere. So it was just Dawn and I. It took us forever to get to Hay River because we kept stopping to take pictures. The two of us were wanting to get reference pictures. Two artists traveling together was quite fun. His work was very simple, and we had, at his funeral, we pulled every piece of work that he had in the house, and we had an art show that celebrated Dawn. It was really quite beautiful. So I'm continuing to work on 17 hours of painting here. Softening those edges, putting a little paint in, softening the edges, putting a little bit more paint in, creating that darkness, softening the edges. Don also was very helpful for people. He would go to visit people and he wouldn't stay long. He was always on the move. He was always moving, moving, moving. And if you go to my blog, you'll see a picture of him that was taken just weeks before he passed away. And he should not have been able to lift. His heart was in pretty bad shape, but nobody knew that. He didn't know that. We didn't know that. No one knew that. And he was lifting wood above his shoulder. Ian and he had brought in a cord of wood for the winter so that he could keep the house warm. <laughs> He was a really busy guy. He just was go, 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 go. He lost two fingers in an accident. He was working with a saw and two of his fingers were gone. <laughs> and so he had fun with that forever afterwards, you know, saying, give me three. It was on his left hand. So the kids will have that as a big memory, especially the young ones will have that as a big memory. It's the ongoing joke in the, in the family that uh, it, it might be genetic. <laughs> he had a quirky sense of humor. We enjoyed that tremendously. And I really enjoyed listening to him and, and my husband talk and laugh and carry on. Every Saturday they would chat and in his later years and that was just wonderful. So our oldest came to visit one time and he didn't tell his grandfather he was going down. He told my parents because they were in Texas and needed to come back to be able to see him so they came back a little early so that they could see him but he went there to grandpa's house and and he thought, oh, well, he's not, he's out. He must be out and about. And he sa had coffee with him and he sat down and he just waited. And it wasn't long before Don uh, actually woke up. He was having a nap. <laughs> and he was a little surprised when Alexander, who was, lives in Australia, was there to visit him. 
they had a great visit. It's always special times when you get to spend time with your grandparents when you live far away. The green is showing through here, so I was putting a little extra green and I'll cover it over. All kinds of interesting light happening in this area. And the whole thing is interesting light. In 2015, we went back to our hometown and then we picked up Don and, and brought him with us out west. We had two of our sons with us. We just had two vehicles and he just floated between the two vehicles and visited everybody alone in one vehicle and together in another. And, and we had this wonderful trip with him. If you go onto my blog, you'll see the picture of him with our grandson, his great grandson. That was from that visit. It was special because we had no idea that he would be gone as quickly as he was. So it was a very special time that everyone really was very glad to have had with him. And Ian took him off to see all his nieces and nephews that were out west. Ian got to see them and they got to see Don and Uncle Don and so that worked out really well. So I'm putting in the little veining that's on the petals before they even open up. I also put a link below for an interview that I helped with for our middle son for his gardening channel because Don also grew grapes. So both grandfathers grew grapes and they were sending grapes with us back to Alberta where our son who does gardening lives. So you can go and uh, hear him talk about his grapes. He loved his gardens. He... putting in a little bit of dark in there and cleaning up those edges. So we're finally on to this last petal, I think. 
we're just building up those shapes. I'm always fascinated in how many different colors are in what is ostensibly light white petals. They're very creamy white petals. So Ian's dad, Don, really liked gardening and our middle son really likes gardening. We had a garden for years because Stephen really wanted to garden. So even when he was four years old and we moved to Yellowknife, then he wanted a garden. So we had gardens from that time on until he stopped coming home because he was grown up and he was finished school. And then we quickly put in raspberry bushes because actually Ian and I are not much for gardening. I love flowers, but I love other people to do all the work and I'll just come and photograph them <laughs> so that I can paint them. I'd rather be painting. It's fun how the next generation is interested in what his grandpa was interested in. Adding a little bit of light, moving it around. At this point, I'm putting just tiny bits of paint on and moving it around. I'm putting another bit of paint on and moving it around so that I can get to the point of what I'm seeing in front of me. And it just takes very subtle shifts of amounts of paint even to capture that look. Don was very creative. He would just do anything out of everything. When he painted, he used house paint that he got from the Salvation Army or from secondhand stores or the reused places, and that's what he would paint with. It was interesting trying to frame his work because they were all different sizes on all different kinds of mediums from canvas to cardboard to fabric paint uh, glued onto cardboard. And all kinds of people now have his work around in their homes, all sorts of family members. And here we are putting the veining on the last flower. You can see that I'm looking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The big thing when you're painting is to keep looking at your reference because it's so easy to get lost in painting and not looking at what you're actually working from, whether that's from life or from a photo. I generally work from photos because birds don't stay still and, and I'm painting flowers that don't bloom here or only bloom in the summer and I'm painting in the winters. And I know there are limitations to working just from photos, but we all sort of figure out our, our way with that. So we're getting close to being done. adding in those yellow tufts that are on bearded irises 
and then adding the cast shadow off of them too. Which I found really interesting. Darkening up shapes if I needed to. And now I'm back to the bokehs. Just to fix up those areas that I had missed the shape and, and hadn't done it properly. So I'm just tweaking up the little bokehs in the back and adding a few extra ones. Between painting sessions, I keep my paints in Rubbermaid containers that hold nine by 12 inch disposable palette paper sheets in easily. And here we are, the finished painting called Quiet Glamour. It wasn't a showy flower, but it was certainly a beautiful one alongside of the house. Well, that was a long video. So if you made it to the very end, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next art video.